Hello everyone out there. My name is Eric van Deniken. I am the author of Chariots of the Gods and of course many other titles. In the meantime, I'm quite an old man and therefore there are a lot of questions asked to me by different people concerning my life and my books. Let's start with number one, the idea of Chariots of the Gods. During my high school time, I was strictly educated in a Catholic boarding school led by Jesuits. These are Catholic priests. Of course, I myself was a deep believer in God. I am still am a deep believer in God. Also, I have no idea what God is. I call God the great spirit of the universe in every respect. Now, I had doubts in my own Catholic educations and I simply wanted to know if other communities in antiquity have similar stories than we Christians had. So I start to read other religions, old religions. And then I realized most of these religions tell the same thing. Somebody descended from the sky with smoke, fire, with trembling, loud noise. And the people believe this was God. But the real God, the omnipotent God, does not need a vehicle in which to move from point A to point B. The real God would be all over, like a spirit. So this couldn't be God. I started to think and I started to write. At that time, roughly 1950, 1951, in the German-speaking world, there was a magazine called Neues Europa, New Europe. And for this magazine, I published several articles already in 1950, 51, 52. And they all had to do with my later books with Chariots of the Gods. But I was a writer already in the beginning of the 50s. First, it was a catastrophe that the book came on the market. Nobody wanted the book. I was proud like every young writer. I was proud that I had a wonderful story, but I could not find a publisher. I sent my story to 20 German publishers and it always came back with we are not interested or it's too speculative or it's not scientific enough etc. I was absolutely disappointed and we have to know at that time I was manager of a first class hotel in Switzerland. This had to do with my past and my parents. I grew up in the hotel business. So as a hotel director, I wrote Chariots of the Gods. I could not find a publisher because one of my hotel guests helped me to find the publisher. Finally, Chariots of the Gods came on the market. Now in those years, in Switzerland, there was a magazine called Die Weltwoche, roughly translated the, the week in the world. And this magazine started to publish parts of Chariots of the Gods before the book was on the market. A few months later the book came and it became a bestseller immediately because of the help of this magazine Die Weltwoche. Already then the question raised among the scientific community are we alone in the universe? Are there others? What do forms of life need? For example, we human-like beings, we need, of course, air, we need oxygen. Are there other forms of life? Of course, there are forms of life, the so-called anaerobic bacteria. They need no oxygen. Oxygen is for them like poison. Or even in the heat of a volcano, there are bacteria who survive. So the question already in the beginning of the 50 was, our form of life is probably not unique in the universe. There might be different forms of life which have nothing to do with our form of life, with the oxygen breathing being. Well, I took this topic over and asked, are we alone? In the meantime, I'm definitely sure we are not alone. Well, first we have to understand what panspermia is. There was a Swedish Nobel Prize uh, winner his name was Savante Arrhenius, and he was the first to come up with panspermia. What is panspermia? Imagine somewhere in the universe, the first form of life appears, and this first form of life spread out their own form of life. Imagine it like dust. 
you spread out your own DNA, trillions and trillions out of the universe. And you know, of course, the biggest part of your DNA will be destroyed because it comes into the heat of a sun or into the surface of a planet where they will never survive. But a smaller part of it will come to planets which have similar conditions than we. And there life starts again. So panspermia means life is spread out in the whole universe and not only on a sm small part of the universe. I am absolutely sure our form of life is part of panspermia. Already then, in 1968, all the, the so-called clever or serious scientists attacked and came and said, Eric, even if extraterrestrial life would exist, even if we expect, uh, expect this as a speculation, we would never come together because the distances between the stars are too far. They are measured in light years and nobody can reach these light years. You would need the speed of, speed of light or something like this, which practically is impossible. So even if they do exist, we do not come together. Already in 1968, I was completely against it. Of course it is possible to come together with life in outer space. Simply, if you use a mother spaceship, what is a mother spaceship? A gigantic construction in which generations live. So the children make children and the children make children, etc. Even if such a mother spaceship could only travel with 2% of the speed of light, it would reach the distance of 10 light years within 500 Earth years. So it is quite possible to travel. And I had this meaning already in 1968. It is quite possible to travel in space without very high speed. It will work. And we have been visited. You know, in the past, these extraterrestrials were here and they had contact with several humans. These humans learned the language of the extraterrestrials. And some of these humans asked them where do you come from? And they always point to the sky and said, from up there. They even give the names of some solar systems which we cannot understand. No one said, we come from Atlantis or we come from another continent. They always said, we come from outer space. Now, theoretically, you cannot exclude the following speculation. Imagine our own human society would have been high advanced some 10 or 20,000 years ago in the past and our advanced civilization would be destroyed for whatever the reason is. But before the destruction, one of our own spaceships disappeared into the outer space. And now, after a few thousand years, our own people came back to see what happened on our planet Earth. So in this version, I would still be right, yes, we were visited from extraterrestrials, but the extraterrestrials are our own ancestors. You cannot exclude this. In the Second World War, uh, America was fighting against Japan in the Pacific Ocean on different islands, for example, on the island of Tana. Now, the natives of Tala, Tana, the locals, had never seen an aircraft. The American soldiers landed with propellant aircrafts and they improv improvised an airstrip on the island. And the American soldiers were very friendly with the natives. They made them present. They give them goodies, all kinds of sweet things, sometimes clothes and shoes. Now the World War ended and the American fighters went back to the United States. 30 years later, one of the American veterans came back to the island simply to see how the island still looks. And what happened? The native had copied in the form of wood and straw aircrafts. They had seen the American aircrafts, the real ones, the one who descended from the sky, but they couldn't understand what an aircraft is. In their view, an aircraft was a bird from the sky, from God. Now these gods disappeared. Now they tried to improvise some birds from the sky in the form of wood and straw and hoped by doing so the gods, these real aircrafts, would descend one day and these strangers would come back and give some goodies 
and, and all kinds of presents to the natives. This is called cargo cult. There are thousand forms of cargo cult. Cargo cult always happens when a high society, I mean a technological high society, comes together with a technological lower society. The lower society does not understand the technology of the higher society. For example, we today we speak about UFOs, but we have no idea what a UFO is. We have no idea of their energy, how do they work, how does anti-gravity work. We don't know it's higher technology and we are the lower technology. Or some ethnologists would go to, go to the upper Amazon river and they came together still today with some Stone Age people. This still exists on our planet. Now these Stone Age people don't know what a flashlight is. They don't know what a pencil is. They don't know what a rifle is. So in their eyes, we have some tools which belongs to the gods. And when the gods, the so-called gods, in that case, the ethnologists disappear, the natives start to improvise all of these different of these objects which they have seen. Of course, not knowing what it is. For example, they make a, a rival out of wood or they imitate a watch out of straw, out of something. These objects never work. Simply in memory of the so-called gods, they imitate these objects. That is what that's what called in ethnology cargo cult. I mean, practically every mythology begins that some beings descended from the sky and some of these gods had sexual intercourse with humans. Now, when I came up to this, I was attacked immediately by clever scientists and critics. They say this is all ridiculous. Humans would never have the same sexual apparatus as extraterrestrials. Humans are completely different. We grew up on our planet. Practically, yes, this is true. But at the beginning of this interview, we were talking about panspermia. Panspermia means spreading out the same form of life in a certain section of the Milky Way. Now, in that case, these extraterrestrials had the same sexual apparatus as the humans because we are the offsprings of them. And by the way, all this crazy idea of having sex, humans and non-humans, is not, has not created my own brain. This comes from the old holy writings. Please, your critics, take the old Bible or the Torah or the Holy Koran. And in all these books, in the beginning, they say the gods created humans according their own image. According their own image, they created the humans. That's why a sexual intercourse is possible, because we are the offspring of them. And practically every mythology speaks about these sexual contacts between so-called gods or sons of the gods and the humans. I mean, we have several examples, not only in the Bible, but in the text of Ap Apocryphix or in the, in the Arjuna text, which is the Mahabharata of, of the old Hindu literature. Look, they took some of the boys, these extraterrestrials, they took some of the boys on, on our planet. They teach them their language. The boys had to learn the language of the extraterrestrials. Then they learned them to write. And then they dictated them all kind of thing. In one of the later e interviews, I will clearly make two or three examples clear to this. But you can watch it already in the Bible. I mean, Moses is talking with so-called God, but not with the real God with an extraterrestrial. And what do these extraterrestrials tell him? They tell him clear how, what he has to do when his people are, are, are infected by, by, by some bacteria. They tell him clearly, they give him differences. They tell him, we have come up from there. We are part of the universe. Moses is only the, the student. Or later in the, in the Bible, we have a book like Enoch, Enoch was taken away by the extraterrestrials. They teach him, or read in the Bible, the book of Ezekiel. It's in every Bible, and at the end of the Old Testament. Ezekiel sees 
somebody descending with loud noise, smoking, trembling, etc. Then they take him away. They bring him to a very high mountain. They explain him a lot of things. Why? Because they knew all this information would go into the holy writings, the holy scriptures of mankind, and would survive thousands of years ago. And later, in the far future, the humans would read these texts and they would realize, hey, this is not human. These are informations of a scientific way, informations given by extraterrestrials, and it must be extraterrestrials. Why? One short example, in the book of Enoch, Enoch is a young boy, he learns the language, they teach him. One of the teachers says to Enoch, human, look out the window. Do you see this little light out there? You humans call it moon, but the moon has no light by itself. The moon receives his light from the sun. And he explained to Enoch why sometimes the moon is full and half and half empty, etc. This is scientific information given to a Stone Age boy before the Great Flood. So in all these examples, the so-called natural explanations doesn't help. We have scientific information that makes everything clear. They were extraterrestrials. They teach some of our young people. Well, that's a very complicated topic, but it's absolutely provable today. Everything talks about evolution. And of course, we have evolution. Of course, we are the product of evolution. But as I said, evolution started because of panspermia. The basic information of the DNA was already coming in from our space to our planet Earth. So evolution created the being like one of our primitive forefathers, and I would say it in non-scientific terms, some of the apes. Now still today, all of our family, take an ape, take a gorilla, take a chimpanzee, they still all exist, but none of them have become intelligent, has created culture, songs, tools, etc. Only we, we have spread out, out of the family of gorillas, chimpanzees, etc. Only we, because the gods made it. They created humans according their own image. How is that practically possible? You simply take a cell of one of these primitive beings, let's say one of the apes of our forefathers. You change the cell, you change the DNA code in the cell, which practically every genetic student today knows how it works. Then you put the cell in a liquid of nourishing. It grows. You put it into the womb of a female of the same species. The female will sooner or later give birth to a child. And the child has, of course, the evolution of this planet. We do belong to this family. I mean, the skeleton, the bones, the head, the chest, it's all the family. But because of this artificial mutation, and the word artificial is very important, we spread out of the family tree. And this is handed down in most of the mythology. We are the product of evolution, but not only. Somebody helped to change our evolution. We are the product. I'm proud of it, not only to be the offspring of an ape, but also have the informations of extraterrestrials out there, our real spiritual fathers.